Thank you. Hello again, everyone. Good evening, and thanks for joining this session uh, for World Affairs Council of Houston's trip to Jordan in May. And in a short while, I will share my screen with you, and we will go over the, uh, the itinerary, the highlights of the trip. And as I'm sure you know, you can just go on the World Affairs Council of Houston's website, uh, so travel pages, and you can download the brochure and um, get the you know, um, sign up information and the details of the brochure, the details of the tour over there and see that at your convenience. So now let me start sharing my screen and here it is. And now I believe you are seeing the, the cover page. Yes. Here it is, uh, Jordan, an adventure in time. Uh, that's a 10 day, uh, eight night trip in May. And uh, now Jordan, this is a general view of the region, general map of the region. Uh, it is a quite um, underestimated and neglected uh, country, I should say. You know, just Middle East is quite, of course, well known and quite frequently in the news. And we always, you know, read about Israel on the one hand, Saudi Arabia and Egypt and things that are going on in, of course, there's the war in Syria and uh, Iraq has its own problems and everything. But Jordan, Jordan is not in the news that much. And it is kind of silently uh, in the um, focus of all these countries here. Syria is to the north. Sorry. Mr. Daniel, if you could. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, Syria is to the north and Iraq is to the east, to the south is the whole Arabian Peninsula with uh, Saudi Arabia. And of course, being um, a neighbor of Israel is not easy for Jordan, has not been easy for Jordan for quite some time. And then through the Gulf of Aqaba, there is Egypt, uh, the Sinai Peninsula, uh, going from uh, in between Mediterranean and uh, the Red Sea. So it's located just as a keystone, you know, just among all these uh, countries. Now, this is a rather small country of the population of 11 million people. Area is about uh, 35,000 uh, square miles, which corresponds to more or less the state of Indiana. It's a semi-constitutional monarchy uh, with a king, King Abdullah II uh, is the current king. Now, one interesting thing is, that first of all, the official name of the country is Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. So there is, of course, this kingdom is, as we said, constitutional monarchy, but this is Hashemite Kingdom. Hashemite family is the ruling family. That's the name of the family. And this Hashemite family, that goes back a couple of hundred years. And uh, now today is King Abdullah's great-grandfather. He was the sheriff, the ruler of Hijaz, region of Saudi Arabia. You see just Medina at the bottom of the uh, map here. And I know just a number of you have been to Saudi Arabia. So these places should be familiar. Uh, Mecca, Medina, the holy sites of um, uh, Islam located in today's you know, Arabian Peninsula, today's Saudi Arabia. So the family was the ruler of that region. And uh, Sheriff Hussein, the great grandfather, he was appointed as the ruler by the Ottoman Sultan at the time, as the, uh, the this area was under Ottoman domination at that time. But then, uh, in connection with the British and also the Saudi family, they rebelled against the Ottomans and with the First World War and everything, they fought against the Ottomans. That is okay. We know that much. Now, what happened was. At some point, just they started ruling today's Jordan, Syria, and Iraq uh, because they got the backing of the British Empire. But then in 1917, 1918, 
British just took back their backing and they played on another horse that was the Saudi family. So Saudi family managed to unify these, the, the peninsula uh, and uh, all the tribes over there and formed the Saudi Arabian kingdom. And the losing family, that was the consolation prize. They went up north and they got Jordan and partially Syria and Iraq. So that is the origin of Jordan. In that sense, Jordan does not correspond to any ethnical group. It's just a combination of various uh, Arabian tribes. And the ruling family came from south and established themselves here with the backing of the British. And another important thing is this family, they claim uh, lineage directly from Prophet Muhammad, the uh, today's king, King Abdullah II. He is the 41st descendant of uh, the Prophet. So in that sense, they are considered to be the holy family as they have the direct you know, connection with the Prophet Muhammad. Now, if we close up a bit, uh, just we see Amman, the, the capital, with a population of about uh, 4 million people and going down south. And our trip will um, concentrate on this main highway, starting from Amman, an excursion outside and going down south a, to the uh, desert area, and then all the way down to Aqaba, uh, to the Gulf of uh, Aqaba. And uh, there we will, uh, our trip will uh, end. Now, um, Jordan, it's although surrounded by all these countries that are um, economically in better position, and especially to the east, uh, they all have either oil or gas. Jordan, interestingly, does not have much of any of that. So in that sense, economically, they are in not so good position, and uh, they have minerals, and they have some agriculture, and a little bit of industry and uh, food exports and trade. They are trying to uh, establish themselves or Amman as a financial, you know, a hub uh, in the region, as many of the main uh, cities in the region do. So in that sense, uh, economically, they are most of the time in dire straits. And I have to mention that, you know, after 1948, uh, just when Israel was established, a mo there was quite a number of Palestinian uh, people who had to leave today's Israel, West Bank, and came into Jordan. So out of 11 million of population, about 3 million are those uh, Palestinians who just came from West Bank and settled in today's Jordan. And they were given Jordanian citizenship, and they are a part of uh, the population uh, today. Now, um, the history of Jordan gives us an uh, very interesting clues about what's going on in the Middle East today, with all the history going back to Romans and before, and then Israeli population, and then uh, the Nabataeans we'll talk about, and the trade routes and everything, and the Crusaders, of course just formed the interesting uh, mixture that uh, is interesting, that is important in explaining what is going on in the region today. Now, our tour will start in the capital. We'll fly into Amman and let's see uh, an overview, that a, a, an aerial view of the city. There is uh, the relatively smaller center with uh, a handful of high-rise buildings. Uh, those are the, you know, just headquarters of uh, important financial uh, companies and banks uh, that are uh, just that they chose to uh, implant themselves uh, in uh, in this region, in this country. It's surrounded by totally uh, low-rise, you know, neighborhoods and settlements. So, um, just as we see here. The architectural style is rather, you know, two, three-story uh, buildings. 
uh, on top of each other. And uh, we will, of course, visit uh, a number of the hills uh, that are today important archaeological sites and uh, see its background from the Batians and from uh, Romans. So there is this Stadel Hill um, that goes back to, uh, actually the history goes back to uh, about um, third millennium BC uh, and uh, the location was settled by different civilizations and by the time Romans came here it was um, already second century AD. Uh, just they expanded the empire and uh, this was their regional government seat of regional government governor so it was an important location. There was a population of about uh, 20,000 people. And uh, so they built all these uh, Roman theaters and forum and uh, Odeon. So we will see what remains of the partially renovated Roman theater, which still is being used today for certain festivals. This is from second century AD and it has a capacity of about 6,000 people. And one of the main gods of the city at the time, Temple of Heracles. And uh, we will also see uh, at the temple, on the top of the Temple Hill, uh, where later uh, Umayyad Empire, after the um, Islamic period at the beginning of um, 7th century, when they captured and after the first four caliphs, Islamic caliphs, the Umayyad dynasty took over the power and uh, their capital was Damascus. But this was also uh, one of the, you know, an important seat for uh, one of the governors of the region. So um, they had an Umayyad palace from 8th century AD. So uh, we will also see as partially renovated and partially kept as it was in ruins. So we will see uh, that too. And with the Islamic heritage and today, of course, being an Islamic you know, majority uh, country, uh, Hashemite kingdom, of course, there's an abundance of mosques. Uh, one of the uh, mosques we are going to visit will be the Husseini Mosque. Uh, it's not actually it's historic, but it doesn't go, you know, hundreds of years. Uh, it was built in 1932 by King Abdullah I. But the site itself uh, was actually um, the site of one of the first mosques of uh, the Islamic era that was built in 640 AD uh, by the second caliph, uh, Caliph Omar. So, um, of course, just with all the wars, uh, it was, you know, on and off, uh, destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed. And this is the final version that was built in 1932. And we are going to visit the mosque. And of course, mosques are always surrounded by, you know, because of the, the, the uh, activity going on, surrounded by marketplaces and shops. And uh, uh, so it is a possible, it's a, a nice place to encounter with local people and uh, get a feeling of the city and the country and the going on uh, culture. So uh, after our first day in Amman, uh, spending in the city center, in the historic center, we will have a short excursion, a little bit to the north of the capital, Jerash. Now Jerash goes back to the uh, Roman times. Of course, it has been occupied uh, for quite a long time. Its history goes back to, uh, goes back 8,000 years, all the way to, uh, Neolithic and then Bronze Age, but what we what remains today uh, is or are the Roman uh, ruins, and uh, it's Gerash. The name comes from the Greco-Roman settlement of Gerasa. Uh, the old Roman name was. This is an old Nymphion. Nymphion is the place for nymphs. You know the um, little fairies or water fairies. So uh, this was a big fountain. Uh, the water was brought in from the hills by aqueducts. And uh, then there was this, this was like a big 
you know, uh, depot, water tank uh, with fountains and with all these niches were ornamented by uh, statues of gods and goddesses or sometimes with the prominent people of the past of the city. So uh, this was one of the those monumental fountains and uh, in the center of uh, the old Roman city and the colonnade and the forum we see here, the entrance to the city and the main square with the gate of Hadrian, Hadrian's gate built in 129 AD. Uh, because of or to, to celebrate the visit of uh, Roman Emperor Hadrian uh, of, of the city. He was in the region. He didn't come just here, but uh, he was here. And then uh, basically he came by ship to Antioch, which is today's in today's uh, Turkey's borders. He had his one of main uh, summer villas over there. And he visited uh, the other important cities of his domain. So this was also a big um, Roman city of about 20,000 people that the population was in second century AD. Now, after visiting uh, Jerash, just close by, as you see, surrounded by partially olive groves. Olive is one of the main you know, uh, products, agricultural products of uh, of the, the uh, country, it will visit the uh, Ajlun castle from 12th century. This is from the time of the Crusaders. Of course, Crusades started uh, at the beginning of 11th century, and uh, they started with the occupation of coastal regions and then expanded their uh, domination inland. So, uh, but this was actually first built against uh, the uh, Crusaders in 12th century by uh, one of the generals of uh, Salatin Ayyubi, the uh, Kurdish general who was fighting against them. A, and then um, it was enlarged by uh, Mamluks who were ruling Egypt at the time but expanded their territory to this region in 13th century. And before all of these, there was a Byzantine monastery uh, in the region. So this is one of the you know fortresses um, to um, locate the attacking armies and uh, as a uh, what is that uh, information tower just to get advanced information about the uh, coming of the enemy. So we will visit the Ajlun castle uh, and get information about the um, crusader existence in the region and come back to Amman for overnight. Now our next day will be from Amman down south, a little bit southwest to the coast of Dead Sea. Now, when we say Dead Sea, we always just remember Israel. Israel is, you know, very good at promoting what they have. And uh, just uh, that sea and Israel, they, they kind of match up. And in our imagination, in our mind, they form the perfect pair. But half of it is in Jordan, actually, the eastern part, right? Just um, so... A, as there are resorts that see resorts on the Israeli side, on the West Bank side, there are also resorts on the Eastern coast, uh, on the um, Jordanian side. So um, the, the Dead Sea, this is a, located in the Jordan Rift Valley. It's about 1400 feet below sea level, the lowest uh, land elevation on Earth's surface. At the deepest part, it is about 997 feet deep. It has 34% salinity. So there is no, you know, living organism uh, in the water. So there are, of course, salt mines in certain parts of it, but mostly it is, it forms just a beautiful, it gives beautiful uh, views. It has a beautiful scenery. And uh, the high mineral content of the mud uh, 
well, people claim that it has curative powers on the pro- first place, and there are companies who use uh, that mud to produce certain uh, cosmetics, which are on sale, both on Israeli and Jordanian sides. So uh, we will stay at a resort uh, by the Dead Sea. And if you want to spend your time um, late in the afternoon, just floating like this person does uh, on our in uh, Dead Sea, you can do that. You can't sink. So just, you know, <laughs> because of the high salinity, of course. And so uh, you can spend late afternoon uh, just taking a mud bath and uh, floating in the uh, uh, Dead Sea. So that will be our day in the Dead Sea. And then we will drive south, taking the main highway. Actually, of course, the arrow does not, you know, go over the highway. Then we'll go following this uh, modern highway. But the thing is that highway actually, it's quite, um, well, just roughly corresponds to the King's Highway, the imperial route connecting Africa with Mesopotamia. So uh, in the past, uh, the goods, well, before Roman times, during the Nabataean times, uh, actually, uh, that is about 600 to 400 years BC, uh, this was one of the main routes that connected uh, Eastern Africa to Mesopotamia. So the goods of Africa, uh, the uh, elephant tusks and uh, ostrich eggs and anything exotic that can be brought from Africa, they would be brought uh, on Nile to Heliopolis, to Memphis, to, to Egypt, and from there, Following this, you know, shown in red, this King's Highway, they would be carried up east first and then to Aqaba, and from there up north to the bigger cities, bigger markets of Mesopotamia, and going all the way inland to uh, the Roman lands and later to Byzantine and uh, uh, other kingdoms of the time. So we will follow this King's Highway. Uh, actually all the way to Aqaba, but today we will just end up in Petra. So this is today's view of King's Highway. And uh, it's just, you know, big winding uh, highway that covers, well, the distance actually in today's highway, all that distance we will cover in about three hours. So it's not, you know, uh, that long of a distance. But of course, on the way, we have certain visits to make. That is Madaba. This is St. Jo- uh, George's uh, Church, a Greek Orthodox Church uh, from 6th century originally. And it is well known for its mosaics. Uh, it was, it's, well, when we say 6th century, of course, it's from Byzantine period originally and destroyed and rebuilt in a broad times. Fortunately, though, the, the mosaic that depicts uh, the um, historic Holy Land that is mostly intact. So that is the main attraction here. Um, so this is Mediterranean and you know Nile River here and the Holy Land in this area. So it's possible to see all those details uh, on this uh, mosaic from 6th century AD. So this is a Madaba that we are going to uh, visit. There is also a, an you know, additional archaeological park with other uh, Roman mosaics that we are going to uh, visit and see. And then we will continue down south a little bit more uh, to a hill, Mount Nebo. Mount Nebo, this was actually, this is, again, you know, just... We talk, we're talking about history, sometimes, you know, mythology, sometimes biblical history, you know, half history, half truth. Um, this is the place where Moses was granted a view of the promised land. So this is where it started. So if, you know, just today's main problem of, you know, who owns what place, this is ours, that is yours. We were here before, you were there, you came later. All that thing started 
here at this time, you know, with God promising Moses the land that he views to the east, uh, to the west side of this Mount Nebo. So this is where it started. So this is how we, you know, just the road climbing up there. And this is also the um, place that is presumed uh, to be his burial place. That is uh, Moses, Prophet Moses. So uh, it, it turned into a place of pilgrimage, of course, and uh, we will visit uh, that too. Now there is a church on top of it. So Mount Nebo. And from now, Mount Nebo, we'll go a little bit down south and we will come to the most monumental crusader castle, castle of all. Uh, this is from 1152, just, you know, in the middle of the crusader uh, phenomenon, crusaders occupation uh, of the time, Karak Castle. Now, a sister castle of this, uh, Karak de Chevalier, that is another castle. This is, that is in Syria, in today's Syria, very similar architecture. And, you know, as uh, good as this one, preserved as good as this one, um, if you are fortunate enough to, you know, have visited Syria before 2011, you would have seen that uh, Crac de Chevalier on that side. Since we can't go there now, but just this is uh, as important and as nice. Uh, as I said, it's built in 1142 and in 1183, again, Salatin uh, besieged the place but could not uh, conquer about 1188, uh, just uh, another uh, Muslim army coming after Saladin uh, was able to uh, capture the place. So we will visit this Crusaders castle, um, Karak castle, and learn about uh, their, how they defended, how they waged wars, and uh, how they came here in the first place, expanded, and then how they um mixed up with the population with the local population that still continues today so the the, the remnants of the crusader population is still in syria in lebanon and in jordan the uh, christian arab population that still continues so after visiting karak we'll drive south to our final destination of the day petra and we'll spend the night and we will visit Petra the following day, which takes a full day. Now, this was the capital of Nabatian Kingdom. Nabatian Kingdom, they were um, an Arabic, uh, of Arabic ethnicity, a, an Arabic kingdom starting from about 6th century BC all the way to 2nd century AD, after which just Roman Empire took over. So it was at the junction of all those trade routes, the King's Highway and the other trade routes coming from uh, connecting to Silk uh, Road and uh, coming from uh, India, the Spice Route. So they all converged at this point. So those uh, that uh, trade activities made them quite rich. So this was the capital and we are going to start visiting with the monumental uh, tombs, of course, this is the most famous uh, view of Petra. When we say Petra, we all just, you know, um, visualize this. This is the sick, the chasm. Uh, actually, just to go there, we go through a, a chasm in the valley, uh, in the hill. And this is quite, as you will see over there when you go there, quite hidden. Uh, in the hill, so it is not quite visible from outside, you know, uh, difficult to find. Um, so this is supposed to be the mausoleum of uh, Nabatian King Aretas IV. And of course, this is not the only place that uh, we are going to visit, but it is a big, this is another view from the top of the hill. And as you see, it is hidden in the, uh, in a, very narrow canyon, actually. Uh, and it has, of course, other monumental tombs and the uh, 
part where there were the settlements, you know, of the Nabataeans. So we are going to visit those, the rock tombs and the uh, location of the uh, Roman settlements. And um, one of the nicknames of the place is Rose City because of the color of the uh, sandstone that's over there, right? So uh, in 109, the Romans took over and when the trade routes changed due to uh, the you know, sea routes becoming more prominent, uh, the place, the city, the Nandabatians and this part of the world just uh, deteriorated and declined uh, without any trade. So this is the Roman settlement and uh, it was rediscovered in 1812. And uh, this place, again, a part of uh, the old Nabatian uh, settlement is called the High Place of Sacrifice. And uh, in the local folklore, it is believed to be the tomb of Aaron, Aaron, the brother of Moses. So, so we will spend our whole day visiting Petra. And uh, then after Petra, now today's name of that location is Wadi Musa. Wadi is a canyon, a valley. So, and we will drive south a little bit more to the desert area, another Wadi to Wadi Rum. Um, this is very you know, interesting with its views. It has Martian views, and that is why maybe uh, it was the background for a couple of Martian movies, you know, the Martians and uh, uh, Red Planets. And uh, so they were all, you know, just uh, uh, the movies were shot in this location, as you see. A, uh, but also it was historically uh, important that is, uh, it has a connection to the Arabian um, rebellion, Arab rebellion, Arab revolt, and T.E. Lawrence, the Lawrence of Arabia. So the movie also partially was, you know, uh, shot uh, in this region, and he was also in this region, you know, just going back and forth from Arabian Peninsula up here and organizing the Arabian the Arab um, tribes uh, against the Ottomans during the First World War. So that all happened in this region. We will stay here in very in a very nice uh, desert camp. Here is uh, a partial view of the desert camp. Yeah, just this is more from uh, the movie of the Martian than from the First World War. Um, so it is really very nice with all the facilities, uh, you know, uh, you know, private bathroom, shower and everything. So uh, it's going to be really very interesting. And also the desert sky uh, at night, you know, it's going to be really uh, beautiful to have the desert uh, uh, experience on four by fours, just driving into uh, the dunes and, uh, uh, you know, in between the high red sandstone uh, cliffs. Now, spending our night in Wadi Rum in this area, we will drive our uh, to our final destination, Aqaba. Uh, this is the only coastal city uh, in Jordan, and it's just you know on the coast, on the Gulf of Aqaba, on the coast, and its ancient name was Eilath in history. Now, actually. Going back to the um, map, now Aqaba is here, and this is the border. Now, just all the three border countries just come together here. This is the border to Israel, and Israel has this little narrow piece of uh, coastline on the Gulf of Aqaba, and to the uh, west is Egypt. So Egypt, Israel, and Jordan, all three countries, and Saudi Arabia to the south, four countries actually, come together. So today's Agaba, Agaba ancient name is Eilath. Today's um, resort town, Israeli resort, resort town, which is here, is called Eilat. actually. It just continues with the ancient name. And there is Taba, the Egyptian resort town here. And to the south of here, now Saudis are trying to um, establish this neom, 
the you know the modern desert uh, city uh, that you might have uh, read about in the news. So going forward, as I was saying, uh, the only coastal city in Jordan on the Gulf of Aqaba, so uh, main uh, resort town. We will spend some time on the coast and visiting the um, the castle of Aqaba. Uh, from 1115, this is another crusader castle and uh, captured by Saladin soldiers uh, in 1170. And uh, the Battle of Aqaba took place in this location in 1917 uh, during the First World War, Arabs versus the Ottoman Empire. And of course, Ottomans were the losers and they had to just leave the place. So we'll visit this um, uh, castle of Aqaba and uh, spend our afternoon and uh, that will be our day. And the next day we'll be driving back to Amman. We'll spend our night and then fly uh, back home from Amman. So that'll be our uh, 10 days in Jordan. Now, let me stop sharing my screen. And here I am. So, as I mentioned at the very beginning, Jordan is quite undeservedly forgotten. Uh, really just, you know, when we say Middle East, of course, um, as I said before, Egypt and uh, Israel and even Saudi Arabia nowadays, you know, they're trying to promote themselves as, as a touristic destination. And the other countries are in news for different reasons, Syria and Iraq. But Jordan, Jordan is just unfortunate in that sense, which is unfortunate that they are not promoting well enough the country. Uh, which is actually brings together, uh, especially now that we can't go to Syria, um, Jordan is the main location that brings together all those civilizations that were there. Uh, second in importance, maybe to Israel, I should say. So all the you know Nabateans and Romans and Crusaders and Islamic empires, they were all there. So if you join, this is what we're going to see. And this is what, you know, we'll talk about during the trip more in detail. If you have any questions, please, now is the time. Uh, what's the cost of this one looking like, Elias? Do you know yet? Well, cost, yeah, it is on the website, actually. Cost is World Affairs Council's thing. So, Amy, do you? Uh, you it is 55.50 for members. 5650 okay. for non-members and if there's a, a single supplement needed it's a thousand dollars okay Plus yes. yes mr daniel there is no flights inside jordan everything you know that is right yeah it is just on uh, on land by bus no flights no domestic flights Elias, have you talked about any uh, side trips from there at the beginning or at the end? Just, just from right. there, yeah, just what can be possible. Um, it's possible, of course, always to visit Israel. That is one thing. Or Turkey, I would say. That's another. Or Egypt. But again, you know, just Turkey is one thing that I think is the uh, would be the best option, I would say. Um, for Egypt unless you are planning to spend another 10 days, it would be, you know, unfair to Egypt. Egypt deserves its own trip. So, it, you know, it won't be a side trip. You have already been to Saudi Arabia. Right. Israel is, you know, just uh, is small enough to be covered, you know, in about three, four days. The highlights, you know, Jerusalem and Masada and, uh, you know, just northern part in Tel Aviv. So a very quick trip uh, can cover the basic parts of uh, Israel. For Turkey, it'll be just, you know, either uh, Istanbul only or Istanbul and Cappadocia, for example, just uh, it's possible to do that in about four days or, yeah, four or five. Again, you know, it's, you know, if you haven't been to Turkey before, you know, and if you just, just 
go to Istanbul, that is fine because there's always a lot to see there. But if you are planning to say, okay, you know, just I'll visit Istanbul and that is for, that's Turkey for me. No, again, just that'll be, that won't be fair to Turkey either. <laughs> just you can spend, you know, 10, 15 days there. So to cover, you know, all the important locations. So um, let me see, just to remind myself, if you give me a second, please. Now, I don't uh, remember the suggested flights for this trip. Uh, Jordan, let me just open up the, okay. Yeah, actually suggested flights are on Turkish Airlines. Yeah. So then Turkey would be perfect. So suggested flights are, you know, via Istanbul. So going there or coming back, I would suggest coming back. Let me see the flight uh, schedule here. Um, flight schedule is, okay, arrive Istanbul 10.50 a.m. Yeah, 2.15 p.m. arrive in Amman. Yeah, going, going there um, or coming back to 24.5 a.m. Hmm, actually going there might be better to be honest, because going there, you arrive in Istanbul at 10.50 a.m. And then the flight from Istanbul to Amman leaves at noon. But on the way back, you arrive in Istanbul at 4.45 a.m. Mm. So, you know, just you will either, you know, go directly to hotel and sleep and spend the first, you know, half of the day right. uh, just resting or uh, just do it on the way going there. So you will arrive there at, you know, there won't be time wasted. You'll arrive there just, you know, 10, 50 a.m. You'll spend your two, three days in Istanbul. And then uh, at noon on May 6th, uh, you will take the flight to Amman. Yeah, we've already been to uh, Istanbul and Ephesus in the past, so we probably would not do the Turkey thing. Then, okay, then Kaparokya. I mean, if you have already been to those two places, Kaparokya is the uh, um, highlight that you haven't been in Turkey. So it looks like, you know, you're bringing Turkey together in patches, Istanbul and <laughs> FSOs. And now the third patch, uh, Kaparokya is missing. Or, you know, Turkish Airlines, again, I mean, you, you can choose to fly um, Qatar Airways and have a stopover in Doha. But again, you're interested in the Qatar trip in November too. Right. So let me remind you that. Yeah. yeah, it would probably, for us, it would probably look more like uh, doing something in Israel or Egypt, one of those two. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or we um, might do an Egypt trip, you know, on a longer time frame at a later, later date. Yeah, uh, Egypt, um, if you want to take a cruise plus Cairo would be, you know, seven days over there, six days minimum over there, you know, without, you know, excluding flight time in Egypt. So six or seven days will give you a whirlwind, you know, trip of Egypt. Yeah, certainly if we were going to Egypt, we'd want to go to the pyramids and Yes, uh, definitely. See, yeah. see Cairo. Yeah, Cairo, two days. One day is one and a half day. But no, actually, Cairo itself is one day. And then there's the pyramids, Giza and Memphis and Solar Boat and everything. That's another day. So two full day. You need two full day for Cairo. And then if you want to take the cruise, Nile cruise, uh, three days or three nights, that is four days down south. Yeah, where does that go? Uh, to Aswan. Uh, of course, it covers Luxor and ends up in Aswan. Okay. Um, or if you don't want to take the cruise, you can fly. You can fly to Luxor and Aswan and then fly back. So, But again, it will more or less take the same time. And you'd probably do that one after you do Cairo or uh, Egypt after? Um, Egypt, yes, yeah, after would be better. Okay. That's right. May, yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. 
That's right. Do you have any questions? It will be it will be a little bit hot, of course, as you go not not, not Cairo, so so, uh, as you go down south to Aswan. You know, just it'll it'll be hot. Like Texas, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Hmm? So yeah, what sort of accommodations will we have in, um, in Jordan? Uh, yes, they are all deluxe accommodations. Uh, let me see if I have the names here in the brochure. Actually, yes, they are given in the, in the brochure in Amman, three nights Amman Grand Hyatt and in Dead Sea, Crown Plaza, a very nice resort. These are all five-star properties. And uh, Petra Old Village, a uh, more, you know, boutique um, uh, hotel with a local atmosphere. And Wadja Room Memories Aisha, one night that uh, tent camp that I, you know, that, that was the photo in uh, my presentation and in Aqaba, Aqaba Intercontinental, one night. So in the brochure, you will see uh, just photos of uh, these accommodations together with uh, their names. And the, is there a minimum size of uh, for the tour, a minimum participation? Yes, generally we operate the tour with a minimum of four people okay. and on average eight, nine people. And we don't have more than 14, 15 people. When, what's the decision timing, commitment uh, as far as deposits? And all well, stuff? this is May. We are in December. So uh, by the beginning of January, by mid-January, just uh, we need to finalize to be able to uh, release the rooms that we are holding now. I mean, the ones that we won't need. Okay. All right, well, if nobody else has any questions, we'll go ahead and uh, say good night. As you know, you can always contact me mm -hmm. <laughs> or Ilias. Um, all I saw was a hand waving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, always go on this camera. Thank you. You can Ilias. always contact us. We are. Thank open. you, Pat and Leon and Sally yeah. and Dave and Mr. Daniel. Have a good evening. Bye. Yeah. Just know Bye. that we're open at the office until the 23rd, and then we won't open back up until the 2nd. So, um, do you have no any com questions? No commitments until okay. the 2nd, at least the 2nd. <laughs> at least the 2nd, that's right. Yeah. So, good night, everyone. Good, good night. night. Bye.